much for joining us. I'm Mike Ackerman, and I've had the privilege of being with you these past several weeks as president of the board of the Sad Star Foundation. And on behalf of Alice Laura, our CEO, we're really delighted that you've chosen to take the next 20, 30 minutes and be with us. Today's a very special day in uh, SADS Facebook Live as we're going to spend the first part of our time together devoted to our families with Timothy Syndrome. And those of you who are joining us from the Timothy Syndrome Alliance, welcome. Uh, we're so glad you were able to shift your schedule to uh, this time. And I'm really uh, excited to see what we're going to learn together from our colleagues who joined us. And so I just want to welcome and thank Dr. Paul Thornton from Cook Children's Medical Center in Fort Worth, Texas. He's at the department chair of endocrinology. He's an expert in hypoglycemia and our Timothy syndrome family certainly know that they have to deal with the low blood sugar issues. So Paul, thanks for, for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Mike. And we have Catherine Timothy, who I've known for years, and, and those of you with Timothy syndrome know her and love her as I do. She is part of the original discovery team that discovered the original genes for long QT syndrome in Mark Keating's lab. And more specifically now, she also was part of the team, his team, that discovered the root cause for Timothy syndrome, or at least a good portion of Timothy syndrome genetically with mutations in the calcium channel. And not surprisingly, with all of her work and her dedication to the children with Timothy syndrome for the past 30 years, the syndrome has been named in her honor. So Catherine Timothy, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Michael. And we have Molly Shaw, a dear friend of mine. Dr. Shaw is the director of pediatric electrophysiology at TOP in Philadelphia. And she has a few more days left as our pre president of PACES, the Pediatric and Adult Congenital Eating Society. And so uh, Molly has been a, a very uh, important member in Timothy Alliance and the care of Timothy Syndrome kids. So Molly, thanks for taking the time out to join us. Thank you, Mike. Thank you for having me. Hello. We're gonna, we're gonna focus on Timothy Syndrome and uh, COVID uh, 19 as it relates as we all know i think we all know we're still in the COVID 19 pandemic earlier this morning we just crossed the three million mark for cases over 200,000 deaths worldwide in the united states we're closing in on 1 million cases and with uh, 55,000 deaths attributed to COVID 19. that's the gloomy news the downside the upside is I'm not aware of any of our families with long QT syndrome across the globe coming down with significant COVID-19. And for Timothy syndrome specifically, Dr. Shaw, are you aware of any cases that have come to your attention of Timothy kids coming down with a significant coronavirus infection? Fortunately, Mike, that hasn't been the case. Um, really happy to report. We have not had any cases. Uh, we have sent out a survey uh, from the Pediatric and Congenital Electrophysiology Society uh, asking similar questions and we haven't had a positive response, which is really encouraging. Great. How about you, Catherine? You probably mm -hmm. know virtually every Timothy syndrome child that's come to attention throughout the world. Are you aware of any? No, but I attribute so much of, of their uh, safety to their parents. They're adhering to all of the the recommendations to keep them safe, and and they really are trying to do everything they can. I I've been um, really pleased with what I've seen them on Facebook of their safety and making masks and going taking them out. Uh, to very secluded places for hikes and things like that so that they are remaining very, very safe. And so I I think that the fact that they're taking this seriously is, is wonderful. Yeah, I think that these parents are amazing and they've done an amazing job, uh, like you pointed out. Maybe we can take a step back um, and just give a reminder because we have people on Facebook Live who may have never even heard of Timothy syndrome and 
and they're joining us and they're saying, is that my long QT or that doesn't sound like Brugada? That doesn't sound like ARVC. So uh, Molly, could you give a 30 to 60 second Reader's Digest version of what is this Timothy syndrome anyway? Yeah, sure, my pleasure. Um, so Timothy syndrome is eponymously named after Catherine Timothy and we're happy to have her here. Um, Timothy syndrome involves mutations in the calcium channel uh, known as the CAC-NA1C channel. And in addition to prolongation of the QT interval, there's a constellation of other systemic manifestations. Uh, these typically include syndactyly, uh, sometimes uh, neurologic and intellectual manifestations, immune deficiencies, metabolic problems, and sometimes structural heart disease. So Timothy syndrome is actually a very rare form, uh, if you will, of, long, of the long QT syndrome family. Um, and uh, it, it involves more than just prolong prolongation of the QT interval and cardiac arrhythmias, which are a part of the syndrome, but not the only part of the syndrome. That's great, thank you. And Catherine, do we have any feel, would you say Timothy syndrome is very, very special in that it's about a one in a million occurrence, or do you think it's maybe not quite that rare? I, I really don't know. Um, I have probably close to 60 children from the literature and that I'm personally aware of. So, so the numbers would be very small. Um, of course, we don't know anything about the Timothy type twos that don't come with syndactyly, generally speaking. Um, and so there might be many more of those that are you know, in the background, but for Timothy type ones, I think the literature and, and doctors are becoming more aware of it. And so there, many of them are referring them to me or to Molly or to Susan Etheridge or to you, Michael. So, um, and, the, and the electrophysiologist pediatric types are, I think, um, are, are being more aware and I, I don't know exactly how many, but I, I think we have, especially in other countries, but in the United States and England and Australia, I, I think those places all over Europe, they, they sort of are very much aware. So I think it's even, could be rarer than one in a million. Yeah. And we heard about long QT syndrome or the heart manifestation, but uh, Dr. Thornton, it's great to have you because one of the things that Timothy syndrome kids deal with and the parents deal with is the low blood sugar issue. And, and so what is your sense of why do they have a tendency or susceptibility to hypoglycemia and sometimes really, really uh, critical hypoglycemia? Because you are one of the world's experts on hypoglycemia in general and one mechanism of hyperinsulinism. So what's your thoughts on that? What are you exploring? Yes, it's very interesting. Um, you know, there, there are several possibilities as to how the hypoglycemia could occur. And what we do know is that, you know, very sadly, many children as one of the last things that happens them in their lives when they're passing uh, with an intercurrent illness become hypoglycemic and so there, it's very concerning um, that hypoglycemia occurs. You know, the first mechanism that we thought might be involved was through the secretion of too much insulin because the, this calcium channel that, you know, originally was thought to focus primarily on the heart, it turns out it's also expressed in the beta cell, which is the cell in the pancreas that makes insulin. And, you know, calcium entering into the cell is a very important component of secreting insulin. However, unfortunately, when the kids are having low blood sugars, that's the only time when you can tell the cause of the low blood sugar. And many times the children are so sick with other life-threatening conditions that all the testing that needs to be done hasn't been done. So unfortunately, we're left with you know, trying to evaluate some children when they're well 
And of course, that means that you could induce hypoglycemia, which in itself could be very dangerous. So we're sort of caught between a rock and a hard place because we don't have enough information from the kids who've been hypoglycemic and it's potentially dangerous to induce hypoglycemia. And then, you know, the other areas where this channel is expressed is in the pituitary gland, which is very important in the regulation of glucose and also to some extent in the adrenal gland. So um, there are many different possibilities as to what the precise etiology could be. And it's very possible that different children will have different causes. And hence, I think it's important to understand that from, a, from each individual child's perspective. Great. Thanks, Paul. And to follow up that on the febrile illness issue, because for the last several weeks, we've been talking about Brugada syndrome on Facebook Live and how uh, any febrile illness could be Brugada agitating and to encourage them to lower the fever promptly with acetaminophen. Talk about what we should do for Timothy syndrome kids who develop any febrile illness or in this setting of the COVID-19 pandemic, if that fever is because of SARS-CoV-2, what should they do specifically about their temperature and potentially how the febrile illness could agitate the hypoglycemia issue? Paul, we'll start with you and then, then, then Molly. Sure, well, of course, you know, for a condition that we have no cure, prevention is really the only approach. So, and I think, you know, Catherine talked about how it seems like everyone's doing a great job. However, when you get a fever, there's really a couple of things that can happen. Number one is the metabolic rate in your body speeds up and you burn energy faster and energy basically comes from glucose. So we need to keep a good steady supply of glucose. And so that basically means drinking um, or eating, but typically when kids are sick, they don't really want to eat. So we're talking about drinking sugar containing fluids and drinking small amounts because even though vomiting is not a major part of this condition, it, it does affect some children. There's a small percentage of children who are vomiting. So it's very important to take small amounts of sugar-containing fluids. And so that might be something like apple juice or it could be something like Sprite or 7-Up, but not the diet kind. So it has to be the ones with sugar in them. And it's very important to sip on those. Um, some people take the fizz out because belching from drinking it down might make them vomit so drinking flat soda is often a good way to keep your blood sugar up and it's important that they do that every one to two hours during the day and that at night time i would wake the children up in the middle of the night and make sure that they have something to drink and um, you know you want to get at least you know four to six ounces in maybe in the middle of the night to try and keep the blood sugars up and some people use pedialyte but Pedialyte is very good if you have diarrhea, um, but the concentration of sugar in Pedialyte is about um, a half of what you'd find in apple juice or 7-Up or Coke or Sprite or something like that. Um, so it's probably better to use those sort of things unless you're having a lot of diarrhea, in which case the Pedialyte is probably the best. Great, thanks. Molly, anything you would add to that? Um, that was great, Paul. Thank you for that. Um, what I would like to add is that, you know, we're all available to see you virtually. So in addition to everything that Paul just said, if you're concerned, give us a call. We're all doing telemedicine visits. In fact, uh, tomorrow I have 10 telemedicine visits on my schedule. So it's always a good idea for your physician to just eyeball your child and just to make sure that, that your child looks okay from a standpoint we may not be able to do a physical exam but a good eye just just visually child goes a long way and if we have any concerns we can find a mechanism to safely bring you into the hospital and uh, treat your fever and your hypoglycemia if needed so do not uh, do not you know we're, we're all socially distanced but we should not be socially isolated we are available by telephone Right. But it's also important to remember, you know, not to leave it too late. So don't go, don't let your fear of going to the hospital get to the point where you leave it too late. If your child won't drink, if they're not peeing, 
and you, you're concerned they're getting dehydrated, it's safer to go in. You know, the hospital will try and get you into a room where you're not exposed. Wear your mask when you take your child there, have your child wear the mask. But, you know, it's better to go in a tiny bit early than a little too late. And I think we're seeing this with some of the other conditions that our children are having, like our diabetics, for example, are coming in way too late and they're much, much sicker as a result. So, yes, we should have a healthy fear of coronavirus, but we should not let our judgment um, you know, when we judge that our kids are sick, they, they do need to come in. I think, Paul, that's so hugely important because we all have seen the data of, of in the adult world, where have all the heart attacks gone? Where have all the strokes gone? And, and the deaths that have been happening out there um, indirectly related to COVID-19 pandemic, but having nothing to do with the virus from people not getting timely attention to their their non-COVID health issues, which didn't go away after the arrival of this virus. So I think that's really important, Paul. Catherine, what have you learned? Any any tricks that you've learned in interacting with these families to help counter the hypoglycemic tendency that you would add from what Dr. Thornton shared? No, I will always defer to Dr. Thornton. He knows far more about this. But Molly also um, has encouraged her formula, right, Molly, uh, uh, about um, cornstarch. Do you want to tell them a little bit about that? Yeah. I'm not meaning to take away from you, Mike. I know you're the, the moderator, but I do know Molly uh, encourages her people to take a little nighttime meal. And Yeah, Molly, tell us. Yeah. Um I'm not an endocrinologist by disclosure, so um, so really Dr. Thornton is the expert here, but I'll tell you what I advise my, my patients. Um, one, I don't want them to be nil by mouth for more than 10 to 12 hours. So even if your child is really tired and doesn't want to get up in the morning, I very strongly recommend that wake them up uh, in the morning, if they've been sleeping for more than 10 or 12 hours and make sure they get a sugar containing drink, they can then go back to sleep. Uh, maybe they can take their medication at that time and go, go back to sleep. But I really don't want my, my patients who are uh, prone to hypoglycemia um, not drinking sugar containing uh, fluids for more than 10 to 12 hours. Uh, another uh, trick I learned from, from another endocrinologist friend was to uh, use cornstarch. And uh, Dr. Thornton, I'd love to know your opinion about this, but we have these little recipes where uh, families are baking cookies with cornstarch and, and uh, giving the cookies as a, a post dinner time snack uh, just before the kids go to bed. And I think that works pretty well. So, so it's an, an interesting point. So, you know, cornstarch is what we call a long-acting form of glucose. So as if you drink the same amount of sugar in cornstarch, say that would be an apple juice, the cornstarch could last four to six hours. The apple juice could last in your body for like one to two hours. So we consider cornstarch like a long-acting form of glucose. But the trick with cornstarch is it only acts that way when you don't cook it. So it has to be uncooked cornstarch. So oftentimes what we recommend is that people mix it in with maybe some chocolate milk at nighttime or milk, or that they put it in a yogurt and stir it in. And the downside to it is it's a little gritty. And so it's like drinking milk with sand in it. But you know the kids get used to it. You can start off with one teaspoonful, and then eventually you wanna to get to a dose of about two grams per kilogram and that helps keep your blood sugar up for about six hours. Great, thank so you. We would recommend taking that at night time. Of course, when you're sick with fevers and vomiting, it's a little harder to take the cornstarch. So that's why you have to take the short acting sugar much more frequently. Great, Paul, you know, you mentioned earlier that, you know, unlike our other true long QT syndromes, that this syndrome is multi-system in part because this calcium channel is in a lot of tissues 
And we have a question about whether we, any of us know whether COVID-19, meaning the SARS-CoV-2 virus, whether it has any sort of direct effect on the performance of the L-type calcium channel. And do we know anything about that? Um, Molly, Paul, Paul, from an endocrine standpoint, do we know the things that control this calcium channel? Um, we do know what controls it in certainly in the pancreas. Um, um, you know, in the pancreas, it's more related to the potassium sense of the ATP, the KATP channel depolarizing the cell membrane and then the, the calcium channel reacts to the voltage changes and so it opens and closes. Um, but, um, you know, I've, I've heard about the associations of the virus with, you know, how it enters into the cells and possibly through the angiotensin converting enzyme, the, the, the receptors. And so that's an area I don't know a lot about, but we have not yet heard anything specific about its effect on the pancreas. Um, you know, a lot of the information we're hearing about is about patients with diabetes, but their problems are completely different. Yeah. You know, that's a high blood sugar condition. And so I, I think that the associations we're seeing with, you know, the higher degree of death in patients with diabetes is not really related to the virus entering into the cell in particular. It's related to all the other types of illnesses and the effects of high blood sugar on your immune system and lots of different things. So I think it doesn't have a, a, a very direct endocrine targeting like it seems to have on the heart and lungs. Molly, how about, what do you know, uh, any, any signals in the heart directly? Yeah. So again, I'm not aware of any direct association between uh, COVID-2 virus and the calcium channels. As we know, calcium channels are ubiquitous, um, but the way this virus enters um, the respiratory system is through the ACE receptors, uh, and whether there is a direct effect on the calcium channels is unknown. And we do know, as with all viruses, and this is not just COVID-2, Viruses can cause myocarditis. So viruses can affect the heart muscle irrespective of your underlying genotype or your underlying condition. Uh, viruses can cause myocarditis. And with COVID-2, we have seen myocarditis. And I think if you had an underlying genetic condition, um, the, the cytokinin storm would definitely be detrimental to that individual and increase your risk of arrhythmias. So I'm not aware of any direct association between COVID-2 and calcium channels, but I think for any individual who is susceptible to arrhythmias, COVID myocarditis could be life-threatening. Yeah, I think you're right, Molly, and I think we're learning, as we've told the long QT families out there, that just because you have long QT, you're not at any greater risk of bad COVID-19 as long as you're otherwise healthy. and. Uh, Despite that, there is some signals. This virus does get into the heart muscle through the ACE2 receptor, and if it causes its destruction, the release of the cytokines that Dr. Shaw is mentioning, specifically interleukin-6, has been shown to prolong the QT interval of heart muscle cells, and so you could indirectly see uh, a QT agitation. But more importantly, therefore, our Timothy syndrome individuals, thankfully, None have been affected with COVID-19 to date. Let's keep it that way. But I would think that using some of the COVID-19 therapies that are being used right now, like hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin, probably off limits for a Timothy syndrome kid. What do you think, Molly? Oh, I, I would say that 100%. I would say off limit, uh, you know, even in the non-Timothy syndrome, patients, we don't have randomized trials to really ascertain what the benefit of these drugs is. Uh, but I would be, I, I would, I would stand by my statement that I think they should be off limit for Timothy syndrome patients. Great. Well, here's a really good question coming in. We've had a lot of people giving greetings. So from the Timothy syndrome Alliance. And so uh, we'll say, Anne says, hello to you, Molly and Brittany. Oh, I, and I love Brittany and 
and bear, of course. And uh, there's a lot, I won't be able to say all of your names, but here's a good question that's coming um, from several families. And it's really this one. Let's say the COVID-19 pandemic, we're getting the upper hand. We're gonna try to have to figure out coexistence with SARS-CoV-2 because it's not going away. But we do maybe this online life of Molly, your kids and my uh, junior in high school who the last thing she thought or my son in college was that they would be at home doing online learning. And let's say schools back open come fall. What do we suggest or encourage for the Timothy syndrome families who may be concerned about having the kids re-enter school uh, and navigate this with their concerns about their immune system? What, what's going to be your, your take come August when the parents start wondering about going back to school and is it safe to go back to school? Molly, we'll start with you and then Paul and we'll finish with Catherine on that. And that's probably going to bring us close to the top of the hour. Molly, back to school, not back to school. What should our Timothy syndrome kids and parents do? This is a fantastic question. Um, so before we answer back to school, not back to school, I think we all realize that there is nothing like back to normal, right? So before we even address this question, we have to, this, this, once a virus enters a community, it's not just going to go away. The transmission will wax and wane. So we have to maintain social distancing, universal masking. And schools will have to make accommodations for social distancing, how they put the kids together in a classroom, and ensure that every child wears a mask. Now, back to school or not, I think it has to be an individualized approach. I think some children will benefit behaviorally and intellectually by going back to school. And if we can make that possible safely with universal masking and social distancing, then I would endorse that. There are some kids where we're not going to be able to achieve that. And I think those children have to stay at home, do online learning. And as physicians, we have to support that. Great, Molly. Paul. Yes, I think I basically agree with everything and there. I think, you know, this is a good opportunity during the summer months coming up, especially for our smaller, younger kids, is to teach them about, you know, good hand hygiene, you know, teach them how to wear their mask and keep it on and start, you know, working on a little bit of time because, you know, when if they go to school and they're in the classroom for six or seven hours, that's going to be very tough. So. You know, one of the things we can do is start preparing them, explain to them the importance of doing these things. And, you know, hopefully, you know, because a lot of the kids that we know are pretty young kids and they're not going to understand, you know, the logical argument behind everything. So I think it's going to be very important in the next couple of months is really to start practicing these things at home, practice washing your hands, wearing your face mask, so that this is not something, you know, really strange to them. if. They go back to school and, of course, talk to your doctor. Uh, um, each individual patient has, you know, maybe different degrees of immune compromise. So, you know, if you're very susceptible to infection, you might be more concerned than, you know, if your child's never had an infection before. So talk to your own doctor and have a plan in place. That's great. Thanks, Paul. Catherine, what, what is, what's your uh, encouragement to these families? Well, I, I agree with, with both and with Molly and Paul both. Um, I think that the, the parents should also be educating even further the, the educational system, that these kids are vulnerable. They do have um, immune deficiencies uh, that maybe they should be in an, maybe another more secluded area of the classroom. I mean, I don't know. You don't want to isolate them if they're going to go back to school. That's for sure. But these children sometimes have problems with textiles and wearing something on their, their face. It's going to take a whole summer for them to learn how to accept something like that. 
So, um, and and they still might not. I mean, some kids are are more affected uh, by some of these issues than our others. That's for sure. So, so we just need to also, I think, educate the teachers that they have to help in this process. If the kids are going to go back to school, the teachers have to help keep them safe unless a parent of course wills to school with them but i don't expect that would take place but we just need to be especially careful because these children are just a little bit different um, than the norm even the norm that goes to special education right they have other issues so we You're just need to be extremely Back on the hypoglycemia with another follow-up question. First, Brittany shared her Molly Paul success story of applesauce with a third cup of cornstarch at night when sick and keeping them very stable. But another question has come in from Tammy. And Tammy shares that for their son, they're getting the Dexcom G6 continuous glucose or glucometer. Um, is that something that you think that all Timothy syndrome kids ought to have is a way to know or quickly understand what their glucose levels are do you find that helpful um molly are you recommending that and then paul yeah i, I haven't recommended it um i actually would love to hear paul's thoughts uh, i i don't know especially for the younger timothy syndrome patients i I'm just uh, not aware that the, the data has uh, been corroborated in children, uh, but I have not recommended it. Um, but Paul, what are your thoughts? Yeah, this is a very difficult dilemma that we're in because firstly, it's not FDA approved for use um, for other than diabetes. And secondly, many of the children don't even have a diagnosis of hypoglycemia on the books because they've been fortunate and haven't had a problem and so it's going to be very difficult to get that covered by the insurance and then thirdly is um you know most of these kids don't seem to have a problem with hypoglycemia unless they get sick you know we rarely hear of someone saying i'm sure there's like someone out there but it's very unusual Someone will say to us, oh, my child's having hypoglycemia five times a day, and, you know, I, I really need to change the plan like we see with some of our other hypoglycemic disorders. So really, you know, the time where hypoglycemia comes into play appears to be with intercurrent illness. So, um, you know, would you just put it on and off for those times? Probably not. Um, you know, what are you going to do if the blood sugar drops down to 65 and maybe you didn't know that was happening before you're going to rush into the hospital every time so we don't know what to do with the information but what i would say is if someone has had documented hypoglycemia um, they're probably the ones that would most benefit from having the dexcom rather than every child with timothy syndrome and so that would be something you would talk with your endocrinologist about and they would write the prescriptions and help you get it so I think that's probably the best way to go. Catherine, have you found it to be useful in the families that have gotten a DECCOM? Has it given them some reassurance, confidence? Has it made them more worried about things? What's been the report of those families who've chosen to get one and use one? Catherine, any thoughts? Have you gotten any feedback on that? Um, actually, I, there's a little bit of a reverberation, so I didn't catch all that you had to say. I apologize. Yeah, no problem. We'll just, we have a couple more questions here that have come in. Okay. One, one is uh, a question on CPDC from Sonia and, uh, and another one from Claudia. And that just gives me a reminder to tell our CPBT families and all of our other families to join us again this Friday, same time, and I'll be joined by a dear friend of mine, Dr. Silvia Priori from Italy, who she and I will be fielding your questions 
on the long QT syndrome, CPVT, Brugada, as it relates. And we'll make sure we comment on CPVT. So Claudia, please come back uh, on Friday. Uh, you're gonna like that session. Somebody's asking about the mass and we'll let Maureen have the last question. If they have Timothy syndrome and maybe asthma tendency, are we concerned at all that the mass will aggravate their asthma? Molly, are you concerned about the mass bothering the asthma tendency? You know, that, that is a great question. Uh, I think if the asthma is triggered by uh, some kind of an allergen, uh, I think you'd have to pick a fabric that's hypoallergenic. Um, but that is a great question, and I don't think I can give a blanket answer to everyone. But my my advice would be to to pick fabric that is hypoallergenic. Yeah, and that um, I think uh, with that, um, Catherine shares us this message. She says thank you to this amazing panel of experts. So on behalf of Catherine, uh, Catherine middle name Ann, I want to thank you. So. Catherine Timothy, Dr. Paul Thornton, and Dr. Molly Shaw, thanks so much for choosing to join us here on SADS Facebook Live. I, I know that our families with Timothy Syndrome and the Timothy Syndrome Alliance have benefited a great deal from you taking your time uh, to be with us today. So thanks so much for joining us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Stay safe, be well. Thank you, everyone. And for those of you who know me, feel free to shoot me an email if you have any questions um, over the next few days. And, and I, know, I know all of you are looking to get back to normal. And as I shared with you, Alice Laura reminds me, fill out the SAD survey. The SAD survey lets you tell us if there's any members in the SADS family community that have been affected with coronavirus to let us know. So do fill out that survey and thanks to those who filled it out. Remember universal masking. And so this is my reminder to you for that. This was my first rollerblading of our dog, Bella, the other day. So I had my mask on. Um, and then some of you know who've been joining us regularly that tomorrow is my granddaughter's three month birthday and I haven't seen her since February 16th live. So we're all trying to stay connected. So stay connected, no fear, refuse to fear, be prepared, be vigilant and be confident and stay Corona free for as long as we all can. The longer we can, the better because there are new therapies being explored, new insights being made and the longer we can stay uh, Corona free the better for all of us. And so until next time, thanks for joining us. And again, Molly, Paul, Catherine, thanks so much. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.